There are great academic discussions today about the causes of evil. You will hear people discuss all the reasons why evil exists and of course how it needs to be addressed. There have been many myths that have been established over history about where evil came from and why evil exists. Probably one of the most well-known Greek myths about the origin of evil is Pandora's box. Zeus, as the myth goes, was offended by two brothers, the god Zeus in Greek mythology was offended by two brothers. And in reaction to how they had offended the gods, he created a woman, the myth says, a very beautiful, beautiful woman. He took clay and made this lovely lady, and one of the two brothers that had offended Zeus married the lady. Zeus then created this spectacular box as a wedding present for Pandora, the lady, and her new husband, one of the brothers who had offended him. There was only one instruction given to Pandora, you are not to open this box. You can enjoy it, you can look at it, you can admire it, but under no circumstances do you take this key and open the box. Well, as the myth goes, Pandora is passing this box every day and she is dying to know what's in it. It's interesting that Zeus gave her a box and gave her a key and told her don't use it. <laughs> but after she couldn't take it anymore, she took the key, she opened the box, thus Pandora's box, and out of the box, as the myth goes, all manner of evil emerged. Death, disease, destruction, illness, murder, envy, all manner of evil just erupted out of the box. And when all of this evil came out, she just collapsed and wept because she had opened up a door for evil to enter the world. She closed the box. Her husband came in and saw her weeping because she had let loose evil in the world. Well, that's a myth. It's a Greek myth. There is no Zeus. There were no two brothers before the first woman. But one thing is consistent, and that is that a human being unleash something that expanded to the world. There is a cloud cover that covers the human race. A cloud cover of destruction and we, we look at it and we say how could he do that, she do that, or I do that? Because there's this covering. And God said, as we've studied, in chapter 2, verse 17, every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree in the midst of the garden, do not eat it or you're going to die. You're going to die. So the cloud cover that covers the human race can be summed up in one word, and that is the word death. That's the cloud cover. It, it, no matter what you try to do with it, it just covers stuff. It just keeps coming up. And he says, you shall surely die. But as we've already explained, the word death in the Bible means separation. So forget the word death for a moment and just think of the word separation. When a physical body dies, the soul leaves. The soul is separated from the body. So the body can no longer function because the life has been separated, thus death. So any illegitimate separation 
equals death. Okay, remember that now for where we're going. Any illegitimate separation is the definition biblically of death. Death does not mean something ends. It means something has separated. So God says, on the day you eat of this fruit, there will be a separation that will occur and you will die. Our purpose today is for you to understand the categories of death. Because I can assure you that most here today, if not all, have died, are dying, or will soon be dead because of the definition of death. The Bible says over and over again that sin and death go together. The two cannot be separated. Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sinneth shall die. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. James 1, 15, sin results in death. So the two are always put together. You cannot sin and not die. Every time there is a sin, at that moment, there is a death. But we're defining death, as the Bible defines it, that a separation occurs. Now with that in mind, let's see what happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned against God and what happens to us when we do likewise. Now I know some men are already saying, well, you know, I came here to be lifted up. I, I came to church to be lifted up. Verse 7 of Genesis chapter 3, they have eaten of the fruit under the tutelage of Satan. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. He said, on the day you eat, you will die. They did, but not physically. They didn't die for hundreds of years, physically. What happened that day was they died spiritually because a separation occurred between them and God. So the first kind of death is spiritual death, where your relationship with God is broken. It says, when they ate, their eyes were opened. Well, wait a minute, they could already see. All the trees of the garden you may freely eat. They could see the trees. They could see the fruit on the trees that they could eat from. They were not physically blind. What does he mean on the day they ate, their eyes would be open? Their conscience would for the first time be exposed to evil. They would become, let's change the word, aware of something they were never aware of before. And that is the consequence of evil. They had not known evil till this point. They had only known good because everything God made was good. But once they obeyed the conscience, which is God's regulatory system of the soul, became aware of something it was never supposed to become aware of. And I bet you all of us have had experiences in our lives where we look back and say, I wish I didn't know that. Because now that I know it, it has messed me up. That's why we, just, we try to protect our children from seeing certain things or being exposed to certain things so that they don't become aware of the evil for as long as we can. God says, I don't want you to eat because I don't want you to become aware. I do not want you to become a decipherer of good and evil. So if you stick with me, your conscience will be protected from illegitimate exposure. 
But because they disobeyed God, they were exposed to something. And now, watch this, they are hiding from God. It says that when they got exposed to evil, it affected their relationship with God and they sewed fig leaves around themselves to cover themselves because what was supposed to be natural now became immodest. That's why when you wear clothes, people describe you as modest or immodest because the exposure is now viewed as something inappropriate. And so they are now exposed and they don't want God to see. They don't want God to see their exposure. And so they do what we all do when we're exposed, we cover up. It says they hid behind the trees. Oh, wait a minute now. Those are good trees. All the trees are good because everything God made was good. They sewed their loincloths with leaves from the trees. So they not only hide from God, they hide from God in his blessings. They use the goodness of God as their hiding place. How many folk here this morning are hiding in church? You're in the place that God created, but you hidden. And you got your good looking lawn cloths on. He's hiding in the place of blessing. So God has to come looking for them because they have run from God. Spiritual death is where there is an illegitimate separation from fellowship with the living God. And sin produces an illegitimate, something God does not want, separation from God. And the Bible says this separation has affected and infected the whole human race. Ephesians chapter 2, you are dead in your trespasses and in your sins. Talking about spiritual death. That this unsaved world walks around spiritually disconnected from God and the worst part about it is they don't even know it. You know why? Because they're wearing fig leaves. Fig leaves of religion, fig leaves of trying to be a nice person, fig leaves of popularity, fig leaves, they, they want to look like it's okay while they hide. Hide behind using the name God, hide behind being religious. They hide, they hide. But, but there's a spiritual disconnect because of disobedience to the revealed will of God. We've all felt the sting of that. That's why 1 John 1 talks about our fellowship with God when we sin because it, it, the fellowship is broken. He, he goes so far and says in 1 John 1, and if you say you haven't sinned, when I know you've sinned, just let me tell you, you and I are not on the same page. So unfortunately, even many of God's children are walking around disconnected from the true and living God because we're hiding. And so there is this spiritual separation. Notice their lawn cloths are made of leaves. The leaves are on the trees. So they got to break the leaves off the trees in order to make the lawn cloths because what was supposed to be fine is no longer fine anymore in light of their disobedience. In other words, they, they patch together a solution. Let's, let's, let's do a little patchwork because if we can patch it up good enough, we can be covered. Only problem is an omniscient God knows. So God, they heard the sound of the Lord God, verse 9, walking in the garden. So that's probably Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Look at it. The weather's nice. The trees are nice. And they hear the rustling 
of the Lord God in the garden. The God that they used to walk with, they now run from. They used to hang out with God. They, they would be kicking it with the Lord. And all of a sudden, they're, they're now hiding because they're exposed. God asked three questions. Verse 9, where? Adam, where you at? Verse 11, who? Who told you you were naked? Verse 13, what? What is this you have done? Now let me explain something. God doesn't ask questions so he can find our answers he's not aware of. Okay, let's get that straight. He's not asking questions so you can give him data that he does not know. The reason God asks questions is to promote self-examination. He wants to ask you the question so you can answer it for you. He wants to see whether you're going to tell you the truth. Now stay with me here. Because he already knows the truth. But whether you want to see, because what we, what we want to do is, uh, because we can't handle the truth, What is this you've done? I made a mistake. Uh, no, I think it's a little bit deeper than that. We don't want to answer the question outright for what it is. Sinful rebellion against the holy God, against his commandment and his instruction. And so there was a spiritual death. What is this you have done? I know some of us are raising the question, wait a minute, all this over some fruit? Mean? Come on now. Come on now. We got to go through all this over some fruit. No, no, no. If you, if you get stuck on the fruit, you've missed it. Satan said to her in verse 5 of chapter 3, if you eat the fruit, you can be like God. And you can know what God knows and you can be your own God. You can be independent from God. You can be autonomous from God. So it wasn't just about fruit. It was about claiming my own deity. I don't need to do what you say, God. I'm my own God. I don't have to answer to no God. <laughs> You're looking at him. So it was a God issue and a deity issue and a defining issue, no longer a dependent issue. And so there was spiritual death. And whenever we have broken fellowship with God due to sin, even if we're a believer, we died. We're not communicating, or we're hidden, we're, we're not, God and us are not on the same page, no matter how, how well your fig leaves have been sewn together. Something else happened. He didn't just die spiritually. He died emotionally, and she died emotionally. Notice what he says. Verse 10, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself. Wait a minute. He's now living a life of fear. Fear is an emotion. Because I was naked, he's now living a life of shame. He's now knowing what it feels like to feel guilty for disobeying. So his emotions have been turned inside out, upside down, because there has been a death. Why? Because there has been a separation from well-being. You know how it is when you're feeling well emotionally and you're happy and you're excited and, and you're, you're no longer nervous and things are calm and you are in control of your emotions and they're not taking you every which way but loose because, because you've been stable in your soul but when something happens when you've broken a law or the law you know how it is to feel guilt and shame and to be terrified of what could happen they're now living like this and so they sow fig leaves some of us go to fig leaf counselors paying fig leaf money to get fig leaf relief. 
We, we go to entertainment to help us to forget this gnawing in our soul that something is awry. We pop pills, Prozac and Valium and, uh, to help me to get over this disruption in my well-being. We connect with people because maybe they'll help me to, to forget. We get on drugs to, to give me some kind of ecstasy in the misery that I'm feeling with sowing fig leaves because the emotions have gone awry. We have died in our emotional well-being. He says, I was terrified of you. The God I used to kick it with in the cool of the day, in the, in the pleasantness of the atmosphere, I, I am an emotional wreck. So I ran. I ran from God. Emotions went to shambles. Oh, but that's not the only kind of death, because remember, death is separation. Yeah, they spiritually died, which led to emotional death, and that led to relational death. He says in verse 16 to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. I'll talk about that in a moment. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Mm. Your desire shall be for your husband and he will rule over you. Are there any men here married to a, a controlling wife? You better keep your hand down, I know that. Because you used your role to entice him into eating the fruit, talk about that in a moment, because you used your position to entice him, I am going to amplify your desire to be the head of this house. How do I know that's what he means by desire? Because of chapter 4, verse 7. He says to Cain, if you will do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and it's, here it is, desire is for you. What sin's desire to control you? So when he uses it of the wife, he's using the same thing. Your desire to control him is going to be magnified. So if you are married to a controlling woman, it is the curse at work. If she wants to be your boss, if she wants to, to you to submit to her, if she wants to, and she may have come from a controlling, a matriarchal household, but he says because you wanted to take the role and take his role illegitimately, well, we're going to let you see where that gets you. And I'll tell you where it will get you. He will rule over you. So now the question is, are there any women married to any domineering men? Any men who are verbally abusive or emotionally abusive or physically abusive who, who say, well, you, you ain't my mama and you ain't telling me what to do. I don't have to listen to your advice. I'm the king here. I'm in charge here. And as far as you're concerned, you're a cook, a bottle washer, and you, you have no say so. You, you being a helpmate is totally rejected because he reacts to your domineering and you react to his rule and what you have as a curse is the battle of the sexes in the home. So you wind up fighting for everything, ham and eggs, and you wind up, you wind up fighting for everything. He likes it cold, cold, and she likes it hot, and, and, and she go to bed early, you go to bed late. Everything turns into World War III. Why? Because a death has occurred in the relationship. 
There's a death. Because death means separation. So now we want to separate, now we want to get a divorce, now we want to do all that. Why? We can't live together anymore. Why? Because there's a curse. It didn't start with an argument between the two of them. It started with rebellion against God. It just showed up in the argument at home. And that's why when you sow the fig leaves of going on a vacation, you sow the fig leaves of buying an anniversary gift, you sow the fig leaves of, of well, let's talk, you sow the fig leaves, you, we, we, we trying to, we trying to, we trying to deal with this thing when all you, you sowing is fruit, not root. He says, notice what he says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Still talking about relationships. In pain, you will bring forth your children. One lady was in labor pain. She was starting to moan a little bit. Mm. Mm. Okay, now the contractions are getting closer together. They're getting closer together, so she's feeling it more. Mm. Mm, and then, then when it just got unbearable, she screamed out, I hate you, Eve! <laughs> Every time a woman feels labor pains, it is the reminder of rebellion against God and the pain it brings. But he says not only will you have labor in childbirth, but you will bring them forth in pain. You will have Problems in child rearing. And how many of us have had the pain of raising a child that rebelled, starting at two? <laughs> Terrible twos. Or living with a teenager who rebels. But he talks about the pain of relationship that this thing was going to manifest itself and spin out in all directions. There would be deaths of relationships. Many of you know that. Many who, have, who know the pain of the rebellion that started spiritually, but it wound up showing up relationally. Adam, he says, he will rule over you. He will... He will become this domineering person because of the sin. And so there will be a misdefinition of manhood in this. That he will define manhood by the street, no longer by God. Why, why are you going to do this? Why, 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 why are you going to do this? Well, look, look at what he says. He says to Adam, he says in verse 17, because you listened to the voice of your wife. Ooh. Wait a minute. I'm supposed, didn't, I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to listen to my wife? Isn't she my helpmate? Yeah, until she disagreed with me. The closest person in your life is never to trump God. Okay, how much you love him? I know you love her. I know you didn't want to lose her, but when it comes to me, it trumps her. That the closest person to you is not to overrule me. Now, I know why, I know why he got overruled. Man got sympathetic. See, she, she, come, she come blinking them, them eyelashes. <laughs> hey, baby. I took a little bite of this fruit and I don't want to go down by myself. Uh, so will you, will you help a sister out and join me in my rebellion? And Adam don't want to lose his wife. He don't want, he don't want her to be judged. And, yeah. Because you listen to your mind. So here, here's the basic principle. Adam was responsible. See, the definition of a kingdom man is he's responsible. He didn't say, Adam and Eve, where are y'all? He said, Adam, where are you? Because I commanded you. And you were supposed to deal with it. By the way, man, um, 
Numbers chapter 30 says that a man is responsible for the vows of his wife. So I had this a couple of us get ready to get married, and so so I was counseling them and for their marriage, and so I said, okay, uh, what are some of the challenges? He said, well, she's made all this debt, you know. She's made all this debt, so she's got all these bills. That's that's going to be a challenge. So I said, well, let, let me ask you a question: Are you willing to own them? Oh no, we we got that straight. When when we get married, she got to pay her own bills. So I looked at her and I said, don't marry him. Don't marry, not now, because he don't get it. When you, he marries you, he takes that as his responsibility. You can help with it, but he got to own it. Make a man want to stay single, right? Make a man want to stay single, because you, you're supposed to own that thing, because you are the one responsible. And so he says to him that there will be this clash Relationally, marital conflict. That was not the only kind of death. That would be an economic death. Notice, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, verse 17, which I commanded you saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. But by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till the, you return to the ground. There will be physical repercussions economically for you because death is a separation. Right now, before you rebelled against me, all this stuff grew for you. you I mean, you, you developed it, but, but, I, but I, I, I made it all available for you. Uh, the ground was plenteous. You're going to have plenty of fruit and plenty of vegetables and all that. And it's just going to just naturally happen without you breaking a sweat. Oh, how we would long for the day when you don't have to break a sweat. Why you don't have to make ends meet. He says, because now... Your rebellion against me has created thorns and thistles. In other words, your productivity is going to be interrupted. It's going to be interrupted by this death growth. Thorns and thistles that stick you and irritate you. You're trying to, you're trying to pick berries and you're getting stuck because thorns and thistles with your rebellion against me has affected your ability to provide livelihood without pain. There is an economic cost to this disobedience and many of us know it. Many of us are so in debt with the thorns and thistles of disobedience that we'll have to die before we can pay it off with insurance. Because we've rebelled against God, it shows up over and over and go over again. We got to deal with the thorns and thistles of the people we got to work with, the thorns and thistles we have people we got to work for. We got to deal with all these attitudes. They got to deal with us. I want to change jobs and find something better so I can be at peace because my career is thorns and thistles, even though I get a green paycheck. He says, because you didn't listen to me and you let a human being, even your wife, overrule me, it's going to affect your career. Oh, but that's not all. I know all of us tired of dying by now, but stay with me. <laughs> that's not all. The one we know about most. It would be physical death. He said at the end of verse 19, till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust. Until you return to the ground. That means buried. Okay, stay with me here. Because you are dust. Okay, I don't want you to miss that. You are going back to the ground because that's what you are. You are dust. You're dirt. Okay. 
look at the person next to you. Let's look at them, both sides, look at them. You, you know what you just looked at? Dirt, 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 okay? You may be good looking dirt. You may be rich dirt. You may be sophisticated dirt. You may be well-known dirt. You may be poor dirt. But on your best day, you are dirt. And the proof you are dirt is that you are going to get dirty at the point of your demise because you will go back to the ground. And no matter how much Botox you take, how much cosmetic surgery you get, or how many weeds you have, you are going back to dirt. See, that's why, that's why you can't get too overly impressed with folk. You can't get too overly impressed with folk who look like they got it on, got it going on, because all they, all they are are dirt. They, they, they may have achieved something so, so it don't look dirty, but all they are are dirt. Because they're all going back, we're all going back to the grave. So much for the divinity of man. He says, you're going to go back to dust. Because when you want to be independent from me, there are repercussions. And then there's the worst kind of death. Eternal death. Eternal death. That's where the soul is separated from God forever. We call it hell. That's eternal death. That is where for one billion, one zillion, one quadzillion years, you get to live in your sinfulness forever. Eternal death. That's why he had to put Adam and Eve out of the garden. God says, therefore, verse 23, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and flaming swords, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. A separation from God. But eternal death is forever. When Pandora's husband came in, he saw her keeled over in pain because of the evil she had unleashed by opening the box. Pandora's husband opened the box. And there was one little thing at the bottom of the box. And when he opened the box, the one little thing flitted out of the box. And it had written on it one word. Hope. Hallelujah. All this evil had come out when she opened the box, but when he came afterwards and opened it, one little thing flooded out called hope. With all this death, is there any hope? Verse 15. I will put conflict, enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This woman is going to have a baby. And when this baby comes along, he's going to crush the head of the serpent. So I want to close by introducing you to the hope because it's going to take a long time to unfold it, so because to apply it to all the stuff we've talked about. But to understand history, all of history, from Adam to today, and all the deaths that we all are dealing with, you only have to understand one name given to two men. Romans chapter 5. 
beginning with verse 15. I'm going to read them, read this whole section, and then give you a closing thought. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many, the many who had died. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, Adam. But on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgressions would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let me give you a word of hope. Through the one, Adam, the infection of sin and death was transferred to all men for all time everywhere. But 1 Corinthians 15 says Jesus is the last Adam. So if you want to get it, all you need are two names. Your attachment to the first Adam brings sin and death. But your attachment to the last Adam allows you, watch this, he said, to reign in life. What does it mean to reign in life? It means to no longer be controlled by the graveyard of your existence, no longer to allow sin to be your boss and Satan to be your God. But once Jesus takes over control, the Bible says he said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. So Jesus Christ wants to give you the life back that Satan has ripped off from you in your spiritual relationship, your emotional relationship, your economic relationships, your personal relationships, your physical relationships. He wants to wipe that thing so clean that once you're in right relationship to him, you don't even get to die. Because he says you immediately go to be with the Lord. So he is reversing that thing. I love the phrase, he doesn't just want you to live, he wants you to reign in life. He wants you to tell your emotions what to do. Tell your circumstances what to do. Tell the evil one what to do. And when you get hooked up right with him, death no longer controls you.